All right, this morning we're continuing our series in 1 Samuel. We'll be in 1 Samuel chapter 28 today. Um, and, and I want to dive right in, uh, and at least we're just going to read the first two uh, verses of chapter 28 uh, to start with here uh, real briefly. So it says this, In those days the Philistines gathered their forces for war to fight against Israel. And Achish said to David, Understand that you and your men are to go out with me in the army. David said to Achish, Very well, you, know, you shall know what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. Now, the Philistines are preparing for war. Remember, David's been living among the Philistines. He fled from Saul. Last week we saw he kind of fell to his doubt. He let his doubt overwhelm him, and he thought, how can I ever get away from Saul? And so he fled to the Philistines. He asked Achish, the king of Gath, can I live among you? Can I live with you guys? Can I, I'm coming over to the other side. He gives him Ziklag, uh, this city to go live in. He and his 600 men, they take up residence in Ziklag, and then they start going on these raids into um, the enemies of both Philistia and Israel. Um, and, but, but when he comes back to Achish with his, the spoils of war to give him a gift, Achish says, you know, where have you been raiding today? And David always is very vague and tells him, you know, in the Negeb of Judah. I've been in the area around Judah, which makes Achish think, all right, David has switched over to our side. He's attacking Israelites. Surely he won't ever be able to go back to them because now he's switched sides fully. He's attacking Israelites. But David isn't attacking Israelites. He's putting up a ruse. He's attacking Amalekites and Girgashites and all these other people instead of Israelites. And he's making sure there are no survivors so that no one can say he did otherwise. Now, the Philistines are preparing to go to war against Israel, and Achish says to him, understand that you're going to be fighting with us. We're getting ready to go to war against Israel. You're going to be fighting right by our side. And he's kind of testing him. He doesn't know for sure. He thinks, based on what he has known so far, he thinks that this means that David is on his side, but he doesn't know for sure. He can't say for sure, and so he's kind of putting up this front of, yeah, I'm, I'm on your side. And now he's asked directly, like, you understand you're going to be fighting right alongside the Philistine army. You and your 600 men will be with us. And David says, very, like, he puts up a good front, right? He says, very well, you shall see what your servant can do. Right? He's, that's, a, that's, a, that's the life of an action star. Man, I'm just glad you finally get to see my stuff. You're going to see what I can do. Wait till you see me on the battlefield, Achish. You're going to be so impressed. And, and so he, but he's, you know, he's putting up this front. He doesn't want to fight Israelites. Achish calls his bluff again and says, very well. Which is a very, like that even sounds like a villain, right? Very well. You'll be my bodyguard. And, and you can see him even like wait to like, for life. Like, you're going to be my bodyguard for life. You're always going to be with, you know, right by my side. Because he's, he's ensuring that David can't do any, any funny business, right? He can't be on the end, on the flanks or whatever, right? And decide halfway through the battle to turn against him and take out his own men. He, he's like, no, you're going to be right with me. You're going to be by my side, David. You're going to be my bodyguard forever. As long as you live with me, you're going to be my bodyguard. And I just imagine at this point in the story, it's like, it's like that, you know how some movies start with the, um, you know, so they're, they're your hero getting to some weird, crazy situation, and then it's like freeze frame, record scratch. Yep, that's me. I bet you're wondering how I got in this situation. And then it's like, now it's going to tell the story of that situation. Um, that, that's where we're at, right? That's like, how is David going to get out of this? How is he possibly going to get out of this, that he's going to be called to be Achish's bodyguard, as they're going to go and fight against Israelites? He's really got himself into a jam now. For whatever reason, and again, I think this also, it goes with, you know, storytelling, movies, all that kind of stuff of like, 
Right now, you get that record scratch moment of David being like, oh, how am I going to get out of this? And now smash cut to an entirely different scene. Because we're not going to get to know what happens to David until next week. Never seen someone put a cliffhanger in the middle of a sermon. <laughs> but that's what we just did. Okay. Because we're not going to, we, we'll find out, we'll find out next week how David going to pull this off. Now we're going to dive into an entirely different story starting in verse 3. First Samuel 28. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the necromancers out of the land. The Philistines assembled and came and encamped in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel, and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of Yahweh, Yahweh did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, Seek out for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a medium and Endor. Okay, so this is setting up the story, right? The first couple, verses three and four are just establishing facts, and they're not cause, causal facts, right? Number one, Samuel had died. Number two, Saul had outlawed mediums and necromancers in the land. Those aren't a result. It sounds, when you read the verse, it sounds like Samuel's death is causing Saul to do that, but it's not the case. He had already done that. These are just facts that lead us to the story, right? So Samuel is dead, mediums are outlawed, the Philistines have gathered their forces for war against Israel, and Saul, in, in a counter move, has gathered his forces uh, to fight against the Philistines. War is imminent, right? All of these things are true. These are the facts that lead us into and inform what happens next. Now, we need to talk for a minute about mediums and necromancers. What do we mean by that? A medium, uh, a necromancer, is a, is a means of contacting the dead, right? These are different, different things talking about people communicating with the dead. For, from here on out, I'll probably just use the term medium, right? Someone who communicates with the dead on behalf of, of a client, right? That they usually have a client in, in mind. That person pays them. They summon a spirit um, in some form. Saul had outlawed that. He'd outlawed mediums and necromancers. But this isn't like a special thing that he did. It's not like, oh, Saul was just particularly against mediums. No, this is just him keeping the law of Moses, Right, this is just Saul enforcing the law of Moses. Not everything he did was bad. Right here, he's just this. This was the law that he enforced, outlawing mediums, which we see multiple times in the law of Moses. But I'll point out two. One is in Leviticus chapter twenty, verse twenty-seven. A man or a woman who is a medium or a necromancer shall surely be put to death. They shall be stoned with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Not a lot of ambiguity there, right? If you're a medium or a necromancer, you should be executed by stoning by your community. Number two, Deuteronomy chapter 18, 10 through 14. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter or as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to Yahweh. And because of these abominations, Yahweh your God is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless before Yahweh your God. These nations which you are about to dispossess, listen to fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, Yahweh your God has not allowed you to do this. God's very serious about the Israelites not practicing these things. Right? He lists them out, and I give you a little more context there in this Deuteronomy passage, because he lists all these different things together, and he says, these are the things that are happening in the nations that I'm sending you into the promised land to dispossess. They do these evil things. Oftentimes when modern readers of the, of the Old Testament read it and hear God say, you know, you should wipe them out, don't leave anybody alive, all that kind of stuff, these like this very extreme thing, we often go like, how that's crazy. I can't believe God would tell them to kill all these people. But it's because they were practicing these things. It's because they were taking their infant children and burning them alive to worship Molech. Because they were doing all of these things. These were ways that they worshipped these foreign gods. 
and he's telling them, you cannot do these things. But as they move into the promised land, they knew this was going to be the case from the beginning. God talks about this in Deuteronomy, that as they go in, they can't take them all out at once. So they have to live with these neighbors who are doing these evil things, and they're going to be influenced by them, right? There's going to be sojourners among them. There's going to be just them having contact with those people, and they're going to be influenced. So he tells them specifically, don't do these things. Now, there's a lot in there that I go, I don't know what the difference is between those things, right? When he says uh, fortune tellers or diviners, when he says mediums or necromancers or those who inquire of the dead, what are the differences between those things? I don't know, and I didn't look it up, okay? Because it doesn't matter, right? It's all just different terms for the same thing. He's just being thorough of going, don't deal with any of these people. It doesn't matter what they call it. It doesn't matter what they call it, if they do these things, stay away from them. He's listing all the different possible ways that they could get this so they don't go like, well, this person's not a necromancer, it's a medium. Doesn't matter, same thing. Don't mess with this stuff. He's telling them, don't do these things. So that's why Saul had outlawed it. He read the law of Moses, he understood that this was true, and so he passed this law he, and seems to have enforced it to some extent. But now, he's not getting any message from God, right? He's not getting any communication from God, he's not getting an answer, he's sought an answer, but he's not gotten one, and he's afraid. And it's, I mean, certainly he's more afraid than he's ever been, because in the past, whenever he had, was faced with a Philistine attack, he would turn to David and tell David, go fight the Philistines. David is now living with the Philistines, and Saul knows it. He knows that David is with the Philistines. And so as, as far as he's concerned, he, what, what does he, why did, would he think that David wouldn't attack him, that he wouldn't fight with the Philistines at this point? So that's what he thinks. He's scared because he doesn't have his number one Philistine killer on his side anymore. And Saul tried various means to contact Yahweh. He tried dreams, tried the Urim and Thummim, he tried prophecy. He couldn't get an answer from Yahweh. Why not? Because he never truly repented from his sin. He never repented. He never turned. He never changed anything of his behavior. His relationship with Yahweh was always transactional. It was always when he needed something. Right? This is the time when he, when he comes to God, is when he is afraid. He's facing an impending battle. Then he wants God to answer him. He wants God to answer him, and he wants him to answer him favorably. Right? He wants the, this answer. He goes, well, if I just can talk to God, then God will tell me that I'm going to win. Then I don't have to be scared anymore. It reminds me of um, when I was in high school, and I played high school football. Um, you know, The team knew that I was a, a Christian, and and so there's a, one friend of mine that would, that would ride the bus with us to, to away games. He would always insist on sitting next to me. And, um, and he would make me pray for him. Like pray, like pray for before, on the way to the game, he'd make me pray. And he would like hold my hand, and he'd hold it really tight. And then he'd be like really into it when I was praying. And I would just pray normal. But he'd be like, yeah, look, and squeezing my hand so tightly. And I was like, you know, he didn't, he didn't, it's not like anything else we ever did. I invite him to church and all kinds of stuff. He never wanted to do any of that. He just, when we were heading to a football game, he wanted me to pray for it. And he'd really get intense into it. Uh, I thought, man, you need to find Jesus, and then when you do, I think you're going to be a Pentecostal. But, <laughs> you know, um, that's the only time he wanted to pray. That's the only time he wanted. Was he wanted that's to pray that, he, that we would win and he wouldn't get hurt and all that kind of stuff. Like he, that's what he was looking for. He just wanted something from God. And that's what Saul's like. He only wants it right before battle, then he wants God's reassurance, God to reassure him. But our relationship with God must be one of following him no matter what, rather than determining what we need to do in order to get God to do what we want, which is often how we face it. It's often how we, we um, interact with God. We need to recognize our need for him all of the time, recognize that we are lost without him, that we need him every day, not just on our hard days. Consider Matthew's account of his own calling in Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. 
As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when they heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. That last little phrase that Jesus responds to them, um, I think it's sometimes taken incorrectly, right? Because he says, you know, it's not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I didn't come to call the righteous, I came to call sinners. But Jesus isn't saying that there are some people who are sinners and some people who are righteous. He isn't saying there are some people who are well and some people who are sick. He's saying you all are sick, right? You all are sinners, but only some of you realize it. Only some of you recognize that truth. And, and, and the tax collectors and sinners, they recognized that truth. The tax collectors knew that what they were doing was wrong. They knew that they were ripping their own people off. They knew they were stealing from their own community. Those who are sinners, I mean, they're called sinners. They knew it. Often, a lot of them were prostitutes and other very obvious sinners. And so they knew it, and they recognized their need. And that's why Jesus says, these are the people that I came for, people that recognize their need for me. We all need him, it's just only some of us recognize it. So Saul, he asked his men to find him a medium, and it, I feel like that's, uh, that, that section is really funny, too, because he, he asked them, like, you know, hey, could you, could you find a medium for me? I know we outlawed it. I know it's illegal, but could you find me a medium? And the men are like, oh, yeah, there's one at Endor, like immediately, <laughs> which <laughs> makes you think, like, they, they've, seen, they've seen her. Right, they've gone to her before. Right, that's a, that, you can imagine Saul being like, wait a minute, how do you, know, how do you get that so fast? Because they're, they're just doing it. They're, they're, they're seeking mediums. They don't care. They're just using it even though it's outlawed. So let's look at his encounter with the medium in Endor, verses 8 through 19. So Saul disguised himself and put on other garments and went, he and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, Divine for me by a spirit, and bring up for me whomever I shall name to you. The woman said to him, Surely you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and necromancers from the land. Why then are you laying a trap for my life to bring about my death? But Saul swore to her by Yahweh, As Yahweh lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? He said, bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, do not be afraid. What do you see? The woman said to Saul, I see a God coming up out of the earth. He said to her, what is his appearance? And she said, an old man is coming up and he is wrapped in a robe. Saul knew that it was Samuel and he bowed with his face to the ground and paid homage. Then Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul answered, I am in great distress, for the Philistines were warring against me, and God turned away from, <clears throat> God turned away from me and answers me no more, either by prophets or by dreams. Therefore I have summoned you to tell me what I should do. And Samuel said, why then do you ask me, since Yahweh has turned from you and become your enemy? Yahweh has done to you as he spoke by me. For Yahweh has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David. Because you did not obey the voice of Yahweh and did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek. Therefore, Yahweh has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, Yahweh will also give, will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me. Yahweh will give the army of Israel also into the hand of the Philistines. So Saul goes to the medium in disguise and asks her to bring up a spirit for him. And she 
responds the way that everybody who's operating in the, the black market responds. Huh, what are you talking about? I would never. I, uh, that's illegal. Don't you know that's illegal? You're trying to trick me into, into doing this thing? Uh, and so Saul so this blasphemous oath, right? He says, in the name of Yahweh, I assure you, you won't be punished for breaking the law of Yahweh. Whoa. Right? And, and by the king, who is the one charged with enforcing the law. Terrible. Terrible thing. He's just confirming how far he's fallen. And so she brings up Samuel. Uh, the medium brings up Samuel. And instantly... Uh, she realizes that Saul is her client. She goes, well, you're Saul. You tricked me. And, and then she describes Samuel's appearance because he says, wait, what do you see? And she says, I see an old man in a robe. And, Sa- and Saul is like, that's got to be Samuel. That's not that specific of a description. An old man in a robe? Seems like I probably a lot of dead guys. But, but he understands it is Samuel. He pays homage to Samuel by bowing to the earth. He bows there. We don't know if he, it's unclear whether he ever sees anything, if he ever sees an image of Samuel, anything like that, but he bows to the earth, which is, again, ironic because he's, he already knows, right? Samuel already told him that God has rejected him. He already knows that, uh, that he's cut off the kingdom from him, and and, and all of these things, Samuel already told him. And now he's trying to access God and access Samuel by means of breaking God's law. Like, it's all just a mess and a weird thing to then bow to him when he's doing what Samuel would not want him to do at all anyway. So then Samuel tells him his message, tells Saul everything that God has already told him is coming true. He says, God already told you he rejected you. He already told you he's ripping the kingdom out from your hand and giving it to David. That's happening. That's already happening. It's all because you didn't obey God's command to wipe out the Amalekites. God had told you to do that. You didn't do it. And so that's what's happening now. You never repented. That's the difference. I, I mean, I think that that seems to be, it seems to me that, that his initial disobedience of not destroying the Amalekites that that is enough to, for him to lose the kingdom, right? The kingdom is going to be out of his hand. But I think the rest of his life could have been much different if he would repent. But he never repents. He never changes. He never goes back and says that what he did was wrong, any of it. He tells him also that he and his sons will die in battle and that the, that the Israelites will lose to the Philistines the next day. Pretty terrible. Um, also, it's all pretty weird, right? Now, this isn't a normal Bible story. Now, this is a, a we, like, wait, there's a, like a ghost or a spirit. What can this passage tell us about life after death? And it's a valid question. And a lot of people would bring this passage up when talking about these kind of things. And so let's talk about it a little bit and look at some other passages as well. In brief, we have to say that this can't tell us much at all. It can't tell us much at all. The number one thing we have to remember about this account is that it's not normative. Right? Nothing about this story is like, and these are normal things that happen to everyone. No, this is an extraordinary event. This is an anomaly. There aren't a lot of counts of this happening over and over in Scripture. The reason people bring it up a lot is because it's the only account like of its kind. Another thing to remember is that Saul is a bad man doing bad things, right? Sometimes, um, and this is actually true, this is true in scripture, uh, but this is true across everything, right? Across books, uh, TV shows, movies, whatever. Oftentimes, something bad is depicted and, and our instinct is like, well, it's endorsing that thing. But it's being done by the bad guy. Right? If we understand, and we clearly understand, that Saul is the bad guy. Right? He, is the, he, is, he is fully fallen. God has rejected him. He's not repentant. All of those things. And he is the one who is then now seeking out a medium that we know for sure is against the law of God. It's even reiterated in this story. 
This is not, that by no means should we read this and go, oh, I should try to use a medium. I should try to summon the dead. That would be cool. No, it's bad, right? It's, it's clearly a bad thing here. We should not see Saul's actions as an endorsement of this behavior. God had outlawed mediums and necromancy for a reason. He outlawed these things because these things are a means by which we invite demonic influence into our lives. It's also unnecessary. When we think about this uh, as a means of, uh, of how, how Saul is trying to contact uh, God, trying to discern God's will, it's not necessary for us. Under the new covenant, we've been given the means to communicate with God. First of all, we've been indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Right? If we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we've been indwelled by the Holy Spirit. We've been given prayer by means we can contact and talk to God whenever we want by the power of the Holy Spirit. We've also been given our brothers and sisters in Christ who are also indwelled with the Holy Spirit that we can talk about these things with, who can give us wise counsel. We have all the means we need to determine what God's will is without seeking advice from the dead. And again, it's clearly not what God wants us to do. Another thing we can see, we should, we should point out, is that Scripture in general does not endorse the idea of ghosts, right? Because that's the other thing we have here is like, this is essentially a ghost story, right? Or a spirit, Saul's spirit, Saul's ghost. Something is being seen here. So what do we do with that? Well, in general, Scripture doesn't endorse the idea of ghosts. I will, tell, I will say that um, a lot of Bible scholars, a lot of theologians, uh, look at this and, and simply say, okay, well, this is a story about, um, this, is a, a, this isn't actually Samuel. This is like a demon or some kind of other like projection. Maybe God is just communicating directly to this person. But this isn't Samuel's actual spirit is not involved here at all. A lot of, a lot of them will say that. Because there's, no, there's nothing in the text that would tell us that, but it makes it a little more comfortable. Right? You just go, well, that's not real. This, this isn't real. This, Samuel didn't actually come. It's either a demon or it's God communicating directly, whatever, but it's not. This isn't actually Samuel. Spirit isn't involved here at all. And if that is more comfortable for you, keep that. That's fine. You can just believe that. That's, it's much easier. And if it feels better for you, I would say just go with that. Okay? But, again, there's nothing in the text that tells us this isn't actually Samuel. It seems to be depicting that this is actually Samuel's spirit. Now, in general, Scripture doesn't in, endorse the idea of ghosts, and we have to take this passage in balance with other passages that tell us that. So, for example, Hebrews chapter 9 Verse 27 says it is appointed once for man to die. It's appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So this, in general, takes out any idea of, you know, oftentimes you see in movies and books and things like that, the idea of unfinished business, that, oh, spirits have unfinished business. It's why they linger on the earth or whatever nonsense like that. No, there's no unfinished business. You die once, then comes judgment. There's no purgatory. There's nothing you can make up for, anything like that. You die once, then comes judgment. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 tells us that, says we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Um, that, that when we are away from the body, when we die and our, our souls leave, that they go to be with Jesus if we are, have died in Christ. That we, that's instantaneously. We see that truth reinforced by the idea of, by, by the story of Jesus on the cross when he's on the cross and the thief is next to him, the thief asks him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he responds, Jesus responds and says to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Saying, you're, you're going to die today, and today you will be with me in paradise. Um, which again, seems it's like pretty instant, instantaneous. Now, take a couple other passages just for some ambiguity. Um, for one thing, the disciples thought ghosts could be real. So Mark chapter 6, 
49 through 50. When they saw him, meaning Jesus, walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. Now, that doesn't tell us that it's right or wrong. It just tells us that the disciples thought that Jesus was a ghost. They seemed to think that the possibility of ghosts were real. Another odd passage that, again, doesn't actually deal with disembodied spirits and deals with bodies, but is just kind of another strange passage, is uh, when Jesus is crucified, uh, Matthew 27, verses 51 through 53, tells us that the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So uh, th- in this passage is, again, talking about actual like resurrected bodies, but it's saying that when Jesus, when Jesus died, this, all these tombs were opened, and that resurrected bodies of people came out and were like seen in Jerusalem. Now, we don't have any idea what happened after that. We don't know what happens to them after that. Like, we don't know, did they just then continue to live for a while and die again? Did they go back to their tombs and, and resume their death? We, we don't know, but it's a, it's a strange passage. Um, and, and with a lot of this, we have to just be willing to hold that mystery. Right? That's ultimately where I land on it, is I don't know exactly what happens here. I don't know why this works I don't know why God chooses to communicate with Saul in this way. Um, it seems that he is actually communicating, they're actually communicating with Samuel. Why is that the case? I don't know. Again, it's not normative. This is an anomaly. Um, and I don't know exactly what's happening. That's something I'll find out when I go to be with Jesus. I'll ask him, what was the deal with that? Right? But I, I don't think we should try to determine anything too directly from this. Definitively, we can say a couple things. I think we can say that no one should attempt to summon or communicate with the dead. Right? Even if it's possible, even if this is an account of this actually happening, um, we should not do it. Right? The scripture is very clear that it's not something God wants us to do. Um, even this passage, even this account tells us it's not something that we should do. Think about the results of it. Like, yes, it worked. It worked for Saul to find out he's going to die tomorrow. Like, not, if that's the case, it, it, I wouldn't want to know. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to know if I was Saul. We can also say that when believers die, their souls go immediately to be with Jesus in paradise. Okay, we'll wrap up with this last section here, 20 through 25. Saul fell at once, full length on the ground, filled with fear because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten nothing all day and all night. And the woman came to Saul, and when she saw that he was terrified, she said to him, Behold, your servant has obeyed you. I have taken my life in my hand and have listened to what you have said to me. Now, therefore, you also obey your servant. Let me set a morsel of bread before you and eat, that you may have strength when you go on your way. He refused and said, I will not eat. But his servants, together with the woman, urged him And he listened to their words. So he arose from the earth and sat on the bed. Now when the woman had a fattened calf in the house, and she quickly killed it, and she took flour and kneaded it and baked unleavened bread of it, and she put it before Saul and his servants, and they ate. And they rose and went went away that night. So Saul collapses to the ground in, in fear and exhaustion and hunger, He's clearly been stressed out about this impending battle and not being able to hear from God. Um, his men, his men and, and this woman convince him to eat something, um, and, and they finally, he finally relents and, and, and agrees to it. They put together a small, sad feast. I mean, it, it, it's terrible. Right? This is nothing good happens here today. And, and notice, though, that this was a, a miracle, right? This was miraculous. They received a miraculous revelation of God's word. Right? God spoke through Samuel to tell Saul this message, and it's a miracle. But if God's not on your side, his miraculous power is actually bad news. Right? If God's not on your side, his miraculous power is actually bad news for you. That's what they're finding out here. 
Let's talk about James chapter 2, verse 19 says, You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Just the fact of believing in God, that, that James passage just says, just the fact of believing God doesn't mean anything. Because demons believe in God, they are, it terrifies them. Because they're not on his side. What we see in this passage is that Saul, he just only wants a relationship with God on his own terms. Right? He repeatedly treats God like a vending machine. Right? He only comes to God when he wants something. And then he tries to figure out, okay, how can I put the right ingredients in to get God to give me what I want? And oftentimes we can be that way in our relationship with God as well. We can think, and not, not, even if that's not generally how we think about it, I think sometimes we get in moments where we treat God that way, where we kind of go like, okay, what do I have to do to get God to do what I want? And that's just not how it's meant to work. We're meant to submit to him. He is our king. I want to end with a, a, this passage in Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Yeah, that's the wrong passage, and I don't know what happened. I think it's actually maybe full speed. I don't know what happened, honestly. You can leave that, leave that off of there. I promise this is in Colossians. I must have the wrong reference. But I'm just going to read, read this passage from Colossians that talks about this idea that we're meant to submit to him. It says this. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from his love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. I want to pause there and go back to the first verse there. Because the way that Paul introduces this idea is, is very important. Right? He says, if... If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy. He's saying, if you have experienced the love of Jesus, if you have experienced comfort from his love, if you have participation in the Holy Spirit, if those things are true, then do these things. Notice that He's saying we have received these things already. If you have received these things, if you have experienced the love of Jesus, then do these things. It's always how these commands work. It's never do these things so that you can experience God's love. It's you have experienced God's love, so then do these things. In response to having experienced encouragement in Christ, comfort from love, participation in the Spirit, then complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being of full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you not look out for his own interests, but also the interests of others. Having this mind in yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He's encouraging us to have the mindset of Jesus, which is one of humility, one of submission, one of sacrifice. He's encouraging us to imitate Christ in that way. But then notice what he says happened to Jesus for the fact that he did that. Because Jesus is, remember, fully God. He is God. He's the creator of the universe, and yet he humbled himself to the point of death on a cross for us, came to rescue us, but he doesn't stay in that humble position because it tells us, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so at the name of Jesus Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In the end, every knee will bow to him. Every knee will bow to him, whether willingly or unwillingly. I bow my knee to him willingly and say, he is king. He is my king. I will obey him. I will do what he says because of what he has done for me, because I have experienced his love, I recognize his glory, I recognize his honor. 
that he is worthy of my submission. So therefore, my relationship with him is not transactional. My, my submission to him is not determined by what I get out of that. I've already gotten everything that I need. I've already received the love of God. I've already experienced his grace and mercy. Therefore, my submission is not conditional. It's not transactional. It's not I will do what God wants me to do so that he will make my life the way I want it to be. No, it's I submit to him regardless of what is happening. We'll wrap up with this, three takeaways for today's message. Number one, repent of the transactional aspects of your relationship with God. We sang that song earlier, Search Me, and and that is part of that process uh, uh, of examining our hearts and considering what parts of our lives do we have that belief that that our relationship with God is transactional, that we do something for him so that he'll do something for us. Number two, communicate with God using the ordinary means that he has granted you. The the ordinary means of, of prayer, of the Holy Spirit, of seeking counsel from wise brothers and sisters in Christ. And third, submit to Jesus and confess that he is Lord. And we're going to remember his um, sacrifice for us right now as we take communion together in just a moment. After that, we'll sing one closing song, and then we'll have uh, a prayer team available over here. If you'd like prayer for anything, they would love to pray for you. Would you bow with me now? Father, we come together uh, this morning, and we do repent uh, of those times that we have had a transactional idea of our relationship with you when our submission has been conditional. God, I pray that we would um, choose to submit to you because you are worthy, because you are king. Father, we remember now your sacrifice for us and thank you for what you did on the cross by sending Jesus for us. In his blessed name we pray, amen.